welcome today uh, for Ask the Expert. We are talking um, with Dame Frances Ascroft, as well as um, Professor and Dr. Barbara Corky, two very esteemed scientists in the field of type 1 diabetes. And um, today we're going to talk a little bit about a new paper that came out Metabolic Cycles and Signals for Insulin Secretion, a review of Volume 34, Issue 7, July 5th, 2022, in Cell Metabolism. And um, truly, I'm going to let, uh, since uh, uh, Barbara, you're one of the authors, I'm going to let you introduce that. And then um, hoping that uh, you two icons in this uh, realm, this field, can, can discuss um, sort of these new ideas and how they may inform um, the current uh, knowledge base. Okay. Well, I think the reason we wrote it, and I'm one of four authors, and it was a very interesting and unusual process that we're all at different institutions, and we had discussions over a period of more than a year, and each of us had different concerns about what the things are that are less well-known, uh, poorly understood, misunderstood, uh, and wanted to put together a, a revised story. And, uh, and that's essentially what, what was the origin of this. And I think there were kind of three main points that we were concerned about. One was the source of ATP. And I had been concerned for maybe 20 or more years with the fact that the rise in bulk ATP ADP ratio in the beta cell in response to glucose stimulation happens long before the closure of the KTP channels. And yet in work done with other people like Dr. Ashcroft, we knew that the effect of uh, a rise in ATP on the KTP channel was almost instantaneous. And so what was this lag about? And I had a, you know, we all had different thoughts about it. And I think finally, some work that was done by two of our collaborators, Matthew Mirrens and Dick Kibbe, showed that there was a peak uh, pyruvate kinase located at the plasma membrane and that it needed to see phosphoenylpyruvate and convert it to ATP in order for the channel to close. And so this then explained why it wasn't the rise in respiration or the bulk ATP ADP ratio that closed the channel. It was this, this other event. And that's one of the main purposes of, of this article that we wrote. So what it means really is that it's an, it's an embellishment on the model that already existed. And, and, and I just want to make it clear at the outset that this isn't a disagreement. It, this is a, a step forward that everything we thought we knew, we still know, but we've learned a few more things and now we've made a model that we think is a little bit better, but guess what? It's gonna be wrong as well. And <laughs> so uh, we will uh, you know, await. And in fact, we challenge all of our colleagues in the field to uh, do the essential experiments to prove that there's a better model. That's how we do science. Okay, the second uh, purpose of this article was to delve a little bit more into the mitochondria, that most people think of mitochondria as doing oxidative phosphorylation and making ATP. But really they have two very important roles in, in the beta cell in terms of insulin secretion. And one of those roles of course is maintaining the energy supply, but the other one which has gotten less attention is generating additional signals that are essential. And so we wanted to separate the mitochondrial role into those two categories. And, and then finally, we wanted to pay attention to the off responses that we all have known for a very long time that insulin secretion and most of the processes that go into it are oscillatory. But we pay a lot of attention to what turns things on, but not enough to what turns things off. And one of the key things that happen in diabetes uh, and even in pre-diabetes is that the oscillatory behavior is lost. And one of my favorite models, which is not part of this article, is that the basal 
hypersecretion is a very important defect that leads to um, type 2 diabetes. So the lack of that off response may be just as important as understanding the on responses. So kind of in a nutshell, I think that's why we wrote the article. Um, Should I yes. respond? Yes, no, that's a fantastic I, summary um, of, the, of, of the approach and the thinking. And yes, uh, please respond, Dr. Ascroft. Well, I mean, I sit in my office and on the wall, there is a quote I've pinned up from Darwin, which he said when he was writing his autobiography, he says that um, uh, his friend Lyle reminded him of it. And it was about the time that he was discussing the opposition of old school geologists to new ideas. And what it says is, let me read it. What a good thing it would be if every scientific man was to die when 60 years old, as afterwards he would be sure to oppose all new directions. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but you know, he never said anything about women and they have also been notorious for changing their minds in popular culture. Uh, so I'm not irrevocably wedded to any particular theory, just as um, uh, Barbara was saying. Um, I think that science is the art of doubt, not of certainty. You should never stick with things when the, when the data change. So, uh, but, the, but the other thing I think is that um, what Feynman said very famously is that science is imagination in a straight jacket. So we are constrained a bit and it's necessary to, you know, if you have a new idea, then you have to rigorously test it and use lots of different approaches and make sure it's repeated in many different labs and in different countries to check that the data are reproducible and the experimental approach is the best one. And you should try various different approaches. And that I think is what the value of this review is because what um, they've put forward is this, this interesting idea, well, more than one interesting idea, and so, as Barbara says, the, um, the thing now is for everybody in the field to go out there and see whether they think they agree with it and whether their, their data fits the, the newer version of the story or whether it's actually going to progress more. I mean, I do think that science is basically a story that we try to tell about the natural world and that... Um, it's a story which is constantly changing, something that politicians don't really understand. <laughs> and, and if I might say so, some scientists. <laughs> and, um, so, so yes, but to go back to this, um, the, 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 it, I, I'd like to say I found it a very interesting, uh, a very interesting paper. Um, the, the first thing was, you know, where the ATP comes for the channel, and I'd like to talk about that a bit. Um, but the other thing was, there's um, a very detailed and beautiful discussion about um, metabolic uh, cycles and so on, which I found enormously helpful. Um, I have to say, I, I find various bits of biochemistry and, and all the different interactions um, rather complex. <laughs> and I find the paper a bit dense and I still haven't um, grasped everything, I'm quite sure. Um, but it's it's very valuable. And finally, I now understand why aspartate goes down um, when you raise blood sugar, <laughs> when you raise extracellular glucose. Um, so I think that um, the KATP channel being um, regulated by glycolytic ATP is not a totally new idea because it's been known for some time in cardiac cells um, where um, there's evidence that pyruvate kinase uh, physically associates with the KATP channel and also that um, it regulates its activity. I was wondering, Barbara, do you know um, if, have you or any of your colleagues ever looked to see whether you've got physical interaction with glycolytic enzymes with um, the channel? I, I, I don't Maybe know. Maybe not yet. You know, Matthew Marins, who actually I think is mm. on here, might be able yes. to answer that question. It's not, it wouldn't be my data, but I think there's yeah. a general consensus and veering in the direction that ends yeah. sort of gather in a variety of places. So it's not as though all of the glycolytic enzymes are sitting there happily in, in the cytosol 
equally distributed. We know that some of them are associated with the mitochondria, and we know that there are a lot of things associated with the uh, 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 plasma membrane. So I don't know, Matt, can Matthew? Uh, yes, I've unmuted him. Matthew, would you like to jump in and add some value? Uh, sure, I can answer that briefly. Um, uh, hello, Fran and uh, hi. Barbara. Hi. Um, so yeah, so we've got actually a paper in preparation um, showing that an entire glycolytic metabolon is in fact associated with KTP and different members of glycolysis are, are regulating the channel. Oh, um, right. Well, that's very interesting. So that's so that'll, a little bit, that'll be out so that's a little bit like the heart then, where there seems to be more than one different um, enzyme associating with it. Yes, very interesting. Thank you. Yes, and including upper glycolysis, we're going to show, which is not yes. uh, part of the story in cardiac myocytes. Actually, the whole metabolon is there, which is pretty fun because the enzymes of upper glycolysis can generate ADP that opens the channel, and then the enzymes of lower glycolysis can generate ATP that closes the channel. So Right, and do you think that metabolism is always constantly there, or do you think that it might... You know, um, I know that in um, neurons, I, I remember that there's something which are called glycolytic bodies, which associate when ATP levels are low in the mm -hmm. cell. I mean, do you think it's a stable thing or do you think that it might? We don't know in beta cells. I think there yeah. is evidence in other mammalian cells that the there could be subcomplexes and they may not be stable yeah. and that they may reversibly associate with cellular structures. I mean, sort of the next approach that, you know, we intend to take is to move the complex. And so to see if, if you know, what happens if compartmentalized yeah. metabolism is no longer where it needs to be. And I think that will address, you know, a, a lot of the questions that I tend to get when I, you know, present our, our work. You know, people ask, well, you know, there are multiple ATP generators in the cell and what is their variable contribution? You know, yeah. how much oxfos contributes to KTP closure, how much glycolysis? And the answer is we don't know yet. Uh, and as you're I, suggesting, Fran, it's an evolving story. And I think the thing that the other thing which I've always, you know, the, that I think is interesting about um, your story is that as I, I'm not quite sure whether you're saying, I think you were saying in the paper, at least in the first version, that um, it, um, it's all pyruvate kinase generated ATP. And I think that's debatable. I think that's highly debatable. And we, I don't, yeah. I, I would not say that. Okay. I well, think, then, then I, think I feel we don't happy. know the contribution of, of the different ATP. See, the generators. thing that I, I was wondering whether, um, you know, if you think about it, the beta cell ch KADP channel is, is closed, m more approximately 90% of it or something is closed at basal um, glucose levels. So, I can't see that that can be pyruvate kinase generated ATP solely. So I'm just wondering whether what you've got is you've got a kind of background inhibition by the um, mitochondrial generated ATP with, with, you know, you've got the oscillations with that being generated locally. I, I don't know. I mean, it's possible, I, I suppose. I, I would say that, that we're also, we're focused on ATP and ADP, but that isn't the whole story. And um, as Fran knows very well, one of my favorite hypotheses until till Matt and, and Dick came up with their very good idea was that it was a uh, long chain acyl CoA that yes. kept the channel <laughs> uh, open. And that's still a reasonable candidate. We just don't have good tools to, to monitor it in re real time, the way that uh, mm. tools have been developed for uh, some other molecules, yeah. calcium and cyclic AMP and so on. So I still think, and the timing of that is, is, is appropriate because initially fatty acid oxidation is inhibited. And that means long chain CoA is not going into the mitochondria, it's in the cytosol. And until something comes along to get it out of there or overcome its inhibition, it could be there. So, and, and, um, and that doesn't mean there aren't other things as well. I think Ross certainly has a lot of interesting roles that we haven't even begun to unravel. The problem about the KATP channel is it's a highly complex um, 
channel. <laughs> and, and it's been, it's a bit of a bugbear, you know, because it's, it's modulated by many different things. And uh, when you look at it in excise patches, it's, it has some very annoying habits, which make studying it extremely difficult. Like, for example, the fact that it tends to run down as soon as you excise the patch. And the other one, which always bugs me, I don't know about you, um, Matt, is um, that the magnesium ADP activation also runs down quite often with time. And it's so variable and, and you can't understand why. I mean, with regard to the KATP channel, I think my view is, um, the one thing that always works is block by ATP. I'm, I'm pretty confident that ATP blocks the channel. <laughs> but everything else <laughs> is a little bit... <laughs> so, so I will add... Oh, can I add one thing? <laughs> um, so, so there was a paper um, that came out yesterday in eLife um, where we actually did intact cell measurements. And we showed that we could raise the cytosolic ATP-ADP ratio by providing mitochondrial fuels um, very effectively, but when we knocked out a specific isoform of pyruvate kinase, or we, we knocked out the ability of mitochondria to generate PEP, the channel would not close, despite the presence of the, the ATP-ADP ratio being elevated in the mm. bulk cytosol. And so I think, I think with that genetic evidence, I, to go back to your earlier question, Fran, I would say that, you know, a few years ago, the evidence was overwhelmingly tipped in favor of the canonical mm. mechanism of mitochondrial ATP regulating the channel. And I would say that as we're, as we're sitting here today, it's, 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 it's shifted quite strongly and Barbara's shaking her head. And I mean, totally you know, I think there are many of us who would poke holes in a lot of the canonical <laughs> arguments and we did in that, in that review. But I think that this new genetic evidence really tips the scales strongly in favor of the compartmentalized mechanism. There might be a role for. I mean, buffering. it does make it does make a lot of sense if you say that because, of course, um, the problem has always been that um, <laughs> one of the things has always been, I think, that has been a, a, a confusion in the literature and really? the ideas over time is that, um, of course, Step um, one. the Three. sorry. Somebody, somebody hasn't, somebody's not muted. Ah, <laughs> okay, oh, someone mute. <laughs> uh, it's you. I will mute him. Sorry. Okay. Continue. <laughs> I'm, I'm not quite sure what I was going to say after that distraction. I think, um, let me see. Um, uh, one of the things that's always been a problem is, you know, um, how does the ATP get from the mitochondria to the membrane? Uh, changes in ATP, I suppose. And the other one has always been, um, how come the channel is um, open at all in the presence of glucose, given that it's got very low, very, very high ATP sensitivity? Um, but, right. I mean, exactly. I, 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 do have a, I do have another suggestion for a hypothesis that I mean I don't know Matt I haven't seen that paper um, and I'm not sure what you used in when I looked at the one in Byrick's archive um, it wasn't it wasn't detail it, it didn't say which the particular amino acids were and it also um, the channel activity seemed it seemed quite low to say that it activated fully if you see what I mean when you give those amino acids, it, uh, it wasn't. It wasn't. Sorry, in oh, inactive. inactive. So, so, yeah. so, so, mitochondrial fuels will make ATP. Oh yes, of course. Synthase, of course. And then sorry. Mitochondrial fuels will make PAP through. But there wasn't. The, so, so, what do you think is closing the channel at, you know, at resting ATP concentrations? Uh, in resting by resting, do you mean in an intact cell at basal levels? Yes, of say, in say that say three millimolar glucose or something. I mean, uh, you know, obviously the channel is mostly shut. I mean, there's no, there is some glycolytic flux even at three millimolar glucose, and you know, and well, you know, there's a complex sitting on the channel of glycolysis, and so Matthew, it could you, be that that's the basal rate. Could you possibly? Um, just share your uh, that eLife paper in the chat for everyone. Oh yeah, let me just send a link, link, and people can take a peek yeah. at it. I also the other think question I have. I mean, there is another question I have, and that is that I mean the problem is 
uh, trying to separate this hypothesis, these two hypotheses, um, and to show that the mitochondrial ATP is not really doing anything. And the difficulty in that is that if you poison the mitochondria, you do anything to the mitochondria, then in a beta cell, you stop glycolysis as well. And that's, that's the argument that you put forward in the pros and cons of the model. But, you know, the beta cell is unusual because it doesn't have the lactate transporter um, MCT1 and it doesn't have much lactate dehydrogenase. So if you block not right of, Sorry? Well, the I know it has some. It, it has some, but if you think about the fact that it's not going to, I mean, it's not producing lactate in response to um, right. if you block the mitochondria. So, so what happens is glycolysis slows. But my question then is, what do, you, what do you think happens in other cells where you have the Warburg effect and glycoly glycolytic ATP production will speed up? You can't if you it. were to take these cells and you inhibit the mitochondria, what would you think would happen to the KATP channel? Wouldn't it, would it, would it close or do you think it's going to open? It, it can't, the glycolysis will not continue because the redox state will inhibit. So it's a different matter. The reason that the lactate production allows a, an increase in glycolysis is because Pyruvate of course, but I'm not leaves that inhibition. So the ATP production is going to be stopped. But not in. But is that true in a? Um, isn't isn't is that actually true in other cells? If you don't get rid of the NADH, it certainly is. I see. I thought that that was going to be. Um... See, lactate is just getting rid of the NADH. But. I thought that the idea was that in, well, that's what I thought, but I mean, if the lactate is leaving. But it can't leave in the beta no, cell. No, but I'm talking, I'm not talking about the beta cell, cells, I'm talking yeah. about the other cell types. Yes. Um, because there are lots of KATP, I'm just wondering whether the hypothesis fits uh, with other cell types, because yeah. I would have thought that then you would, in your scenario, if it was the same thing in your scenario, then, um, if you had these cells in which they could do the Warburg effect when you block the mitochondria, right. you would be generating just glycolytic ATP, but no mitochondrial ATP. And I'm just wondering whether that's a way to have a look and see whether, at least in these cases, um, the channels well, also. How does it regulate. work in heart? Well, certainly... exactly, that's the question. Um, I mean, the I agree. I think that's the a great experiment. So Try I think, hard. well, I think also, but the other thing that you could do is you could also do it in a beta cell because the beta cell might be a bit different from the heart. You could actually just overexpress the lactate transporter and, oh, and then- that does that. Yes, but- I guess you, what you, happens? Yeah, but the difference is I'm suggesting that you block mitochondrial metabolism as well. Right, but I'm saying if, if lactate, if glycolysis can go on and lactate can get out, which it can in that mutation, then you get hypersecretion. Yeah, but that's you, but Matt would argue, I imagine, that well, you would get the, uh, the get the ATP being produced by pyruvate, by um, PEP cycling or whatever, wouldn't you? You could get it either way, but I'm going to make another prediction. We're talking about one single molecule, uh, uh, regulating this exceedingly complex channel in a very complex environment. Yeah. And if it turns out to be that simple, I'll eat my food. <laughs> so will I, I don't think it's like that. Can I, can I just interject for one minute? This is a fascinating discussion. What tools would um, you, know, you need to sort of really examine this? Now you talk about like, you know, the patch, if you're doing patch seek, whatever, as soon as you get the patch out, I'm sorry, not patch seek, uh, patch clamping, I guess, or, or, you know, making a patch of the, of the channel. As soon as you get it out, it, it, it's affected. What kind of tool could uh, alleviate that? I mean, what would you need? Is there anything that's under development in other fields that you could bring in to uh, better examine the ATP channel? 
I think Barbara would say no. <laughs> so, you know, Barbara alluded <laughs> who earlier. Can, who can build this? <laughs> this? This incredibly complex regulation. I mean, the mm. species of, of ADP and ATP matters, right? And yeah. so Fran knows this exceedingly well. So, you know, ADP, when it complexes with magnesium, will open a channel. ATP4 minus is a channel closer, but as soon as ATP complexes with magnesium, it'll have the opposite effect. And so as soon, if you make the system too artificial, uh, you know, you're, you're not really looking at, at physiology. And so it's, you know, many people have asked us, or reviewers have asked us actually, if we could, you know, perhaps use a biosensor or something like that near the channel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the only thing to really capture, you know, the KTP channel activity is, is the patch clamp apparatus that, you know, Fran uses in her lab and that, that we use in our lab. And, uh, and, then, and then we've got, you know, our fuels and, uh, and some genetics, and, and that's what we've got. Um, so it's, you know, if, if we had other tools, this, this job would be easy. <laughs> yeah. Well, the other thing is we, we try to think in fairly simple terms, like there's one thing that controls the channel. There's one thing that controls exocytosis. And we haven't even gotten to that yet. We've just opened, you know, we've just closed the channel, which raises calcium. But there are nine million other steps that are between that closure of, of the channel and rise in ATP and all of the work that has to be done to uh, to get insulin to come out. So I think the only way we can do it right now is the way we're doing it. We have, none of the tools are perfect. Nothing is a complete uh, resemblance of what happens in yeah. vivo. The, you know, the fluorescent tools have made a huge difference in allowing us to understand that there's a, a very important pattern to all of this and there's a time course but uh, and more of those tools are going to be better. This new ability to sense uh, F one six bisphosphate, which mm -hmm. is an important regulator of glycolysis and therefore of ATP production by any mechanism you can think of, uh, that's fantastic. I wish we had about ten more of those that we could all <laughs> use simultaneously, and then we could look at you know interactions among multiple multiple things. The other thing I want to say is that the concept that, that only one thing is the explanation is also probably not valid because I think you can get to the same endpoint, especially if it's an important one like insulin secretion in a multiplicity of ways. Yeah, it's it's going to be a ballet and you're going to have to, re of you know, mm -hmm. enzymes yeah. and molecules and you're having to tease out and separate them, you know, who's doing what. Right. Or what's not who, what's doing what. And that's why all our models are going to be wrong. We, we've got yeah, exactly. And, right the, now. and the channel is such a complicated beast. I, I mean, I've been working on it for so long. I still don't really understand how it works when we're just simply talking about adding ATP or ADB to the inner membrane surface. <laughs> and then we haven't even touched upon um, something like the amplifying mechanisms that go on in or what happens in diabetes. So, <laughs> yeah. The only other thing I'd say is, I think that the, the other thing that we need to think about is the cells that we're using, because oh, yes. um, <laughs> if you think about yeah. it, you know, what glucose concentration are we culturing our beta cells at? And yeah. how, how well, uh, it's, it's fine if you're just looking at the KATP channel, I think, but as soon as you start to put metabolism in the picture, then everything is so much more complex. And how should we treat them? <laughs> and, well, and, and which um, ones and, do we use? I mean, absolutely, I completely agree. Human cells and mouse cells. I'm well, and, and the question is, is the difference between human and mouse partly due to the fact that, um, you know, the human cells come from cadaver organ donors who've probably yeah. been through quite a bit of the mill before we actually even take the eyelets out and then how are they processed and looked after and oh, don't they change? <laughs> Is anyone doing this type of work in um, stem cell derived uh, beta cells? I believe so. Pat mm. McDonald maybe? But I, I think there are a number of groups looking at those. Okay. So but of, course that, but of course that also depends on you know, but the those quality aren't of very it. good either. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I have not yet seen stem cell beta cells that I would want to have instead of the ones I have. 
Okay, that's uh, that's but I mean, my point on it. <laughs> um, I, I, I'd like to open it up to people if you'd like to, ha if you have a question for, um, you know, uh, either Dr. Ashcroft or Dr. Corgi or, or Dr. Marins, please, uh, you know, raise your hand. We unmute you. You can ask a question, um, respectful question, of course. Uh, <laughs> no slinging arrows I mean <laughs> in this space. Um, Yes, yeah, so I can I can hang on for a little longer. I thought it was only going to be half an hour. I can because yes. it's um it's I'm going out for dinner, and so I have Absolutely. to be a bit careful. No, <laughs> but I can course. certainly answer a few questions if people that would, want. That'd to. be much appreciated. Mm -hmm. uh, I see. I mean, Scott. Let's see. He has a wealth of information. Um, oh, did you unmute me? I'm sorry. Hi, everybody. I did, Scott. I thought you were oh, going to okay. have some questions. I, I know, I, I don't know if have I have deep. I don't um, know if I have insightful things to add for this discussion when we have all the experts on. How about just a very blank, open one? Hi, everybody. This is Scott Solomon for. Um, how about just a general discussion of if mitochondrial ATP is unimportant for the KATP channel? Is it not? Is it? That just a generic discussion on the relevance of mitochondrial ATP. I'm I'm just throwing it out there a broad discussion. I I don't want to. I, I I don't have an. Uh, I have I have a, a good. I don't have a leg really. in this fight. I just know mitos are important, but I don't really get into the metabolism of closing the ATP the KATP channel. So I just wonder what how is mito ATP important in this process, and can you speculate on that? Can I? I, I would like to just remind everyone of some experimental work that's been done by Jorge uh, Camarí Rodriguez and his group. And what they have done is permeabilized you know, islets and looked at the effect of a variety of things. And among that, and, and under those circumstances, the channels are out of the picture because you've got holes in the, in the membrane. Uh, under those conditions, that all the things that we know are very important, including PEP, including ATP, stimulate insulin secretion. So the, is ATP important uh, other than how it is affecting the channel? The answer is absolutely. And in, in, in our lab now, we have data showing that <clears throat> a phosphorylation of certain enzymes is coming on and off with the same periodicity. And I don't know what it coordinates with. We think it co coordinates with the bulk rise in the HPA to B ratio. So the answer is that it, you know, we're focused here for a while, at least on the KTP channel, but there, there are a few other important parts in this system. I'd also like to say that this is not a fight. I think you should be careful um, in using those sorts of terminology. Oh this yeah, is, I, I didn't this mean is, to this is, it that way. <laughs> I, I, I love this robust debate. That's why I just <laughs> always is... ask, well, what does Mito ATP do if it's not important for the KTP channel? That's the, it does the generic way. Sorry, I didn't plan my words carefully. <laughs> That's so, okay. We're gonna make you be- a I also didn't people. expect to get unmuted. That's why I, I, had, I, was, I was trying to shovel some salad into my mouth while I was trying to ask the question. Don't worry. I know you have a very uh, deep understanding of uh, type one diabetes, Scott. So thank you for asking that question. And yeah. Oh, and then can I ask one other question of- um, Yeah. What, what would happen? I'm very curious. What would happen if you did some of these experiments in a row zero cell? And what would be the anticipated result in a row zero cell? Hmm. I don't I'll know what it is. I, I the think row zero um, cells. Should, I think oh. Matt should answer that one. I'm sorry. Well, so you know the, what a row zero cell is? It's uh, one which in which the mitochondria are no longer functional. They're not there, basically. Yeah. So uh, I think to answer. Well, let me answer your first question first. So what happens to cells? So. Mitochondrial ATP is completely essential, and no one is ruling out the possibility that mitochondrially derived ATP uh, provides, you know, some regulation of KTP channels. Our question is more: when is each process important? Um, and so, there's no absolutes in this whatsoever. We are not arguing that only pyruvate kinase closes KTP channels, and mitochondria does not, or anything silly like that. 
At, at different times, there are a spectrum of ATP generators. And even in the same cell, at the same time, different mitochondria, as you well know, can carry out different functions. And similarly, you know, you know, in beta cells, plasma membrane-associated mitochondria might have a different function than intracellular mitochondria. We do know if you block mitochondrial ATP that all the pumps shut down. So there are some things that glycolysis just doesn't have the muscle to do. And it can't do that heavy lifting of controlling pumps. So if you block, if you drop, block mito ATP with oligomycin, basically the cell flood with calcium pretty much immediately. It makes a mess. Um, so the ER starts to dump and because um, circa it needs the, so I don't know, that's that. And then- Can I just add yeah. to that? Yeah, go ahead, um, Fran. Um, and that is that um, I think the thing to also remember is that when the KATP channel is um, close to threshold, tiny, tiny changes in um, ATP concentration and channel activity can have dramatic effects on the membrane potential, which is all what we're really interested in. So actually, if you're just sort of switching from, if you're on the threshold for insulin secretion and you're switching between um, spiking and not spiking or secreting and not secreting, then it really doesn't take much ATP and it doesn't take much change in KATP conductance either. There's a sort of, you know, an exponential relationship. Sorry, Matt, go back. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I have one more question, uh, Al uh, Dr. Alejandro Sacado from uh, Miami, and it looks like his uh, student. Uh, uh, it's Juan, it's Juan Almasa, who's also a professor. Okay, also a professor, sorry, I couldn't tell. Yeah, welcome, <laughs> and um, what is your question? No, I, I was fascinated by the idea that you could have something compartmentalized within the beta cell, that, that these reactions happen only in one region, so I wonder where that would be. Is it polarized uh, or not? Matt. Yeah, so I can answer that very briefly. So, I mean, we, we've, most of our data is around the KTP channel. And, you know, you might assume that, uh, that other compartments have a similar structure and some of them don't. So we were very surprised to see that this compartmentalized regulation does not apply to the ER. And so this is an example of what I was talking about where you know, substructures in the cell are very specialized and, you know, might have compartmentalized regulation and others might be regulated, like circa pumps are regulated, we find predominantly by oxidative phosphorylation. So it's, it's a very complex environment. And until we can drill down at the subcellular level, I mean, this, this frankly is what's going to make our model wrong, you know, to go back to the beginning of the discussion of what Fran and Barbara were saying, but, yeah. you know, we're, yeah. we're sort of illuminating where we can see this one channel, but the whole cell is, is a much more complicated place. And other Try things to... actually accumulate at these other membranes, by the way. So in the vicinity of the ER, the lipid metabolizing enzymes can associate under some circumstances and associate with the mitochondria under other circumstances. I think this is one of the great areas for um, future study, especially for young people here, Truly. because, you know, where different things are in the cell and how they form these macromolecular complexes, I think is, you know, the next big. And how long they stay there. Type. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Can I ask uh, a quick question? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, um, actually trying to formulate the question because I'm not quite sure what I'm asking, but uh, presumably the uh, KT, first of all, hi, Fran, hi, Barbara. Hello. <laughs> Hello, is, Ben. <laughs> uh, uh, presumably the mitochondrial ATP, one of its major functions is insulin production and insulin, insulin biosynthesis. So yes. in a stressed beta cell where there's a lot of insulin biosynthesis going on as well, how would that affect the total ATP, the ATP located around the KTP channel, H how would that interact? And could that be part yeah. of the mechanism of uh, dysfunction in the face of, uh, of uh, stress of hyperglycemia? Did that make any sense? <laughs> I think it, in, if I was to look at it, I would say that it really depends on, on how tight these compartments are and where they are. And so, for example, um, you know, it seems to, it, 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 the question is also sort of similar to what, how, how is the KATP channel affected by ATP that is 
um, consumed and ADP produced by, by the sodium pump. You know, there's a lot, 60% of the energy of the beta cell is consumed by the sodium pump in the plasma membrane, I think. So what influence is that having on the KATP channel? I would imagine that has more influence than what you're just saying, because it's right close to it. But but I, th I think that, you know, it's something that's going to have to be looked at and <laughs> sorted out. And it's not obvious at the moment. And these compartments are tiny. They're tiny, tiny. Mm -hmm. So to give you an example of, of how tiny. So in these experiments um, where we look at KTP channel activity, we can we can have a deluge of perme of ADP, which is a KTP channel opener, and we're just hurling it at the channel as fast as we can perfuse it. And yet, you know, the enzymes being associated with it, it's like an, I'm putting up a tiny little umbrella in the rainstorm. And, you know, the enzymes are so close that they can locally generate the ATP and clear out the ADP right at the channel. And so this is exactly what, I mean, we, this is what we see and observe. And to get to Fran's, you know, comment, I 100% agree with her. You know, these local pumps where the plasma on the plasma membrane, they're massive ATP consumers. And this is true in any cell. I mean, any biologist knows that in any given cell at any moment, pumps are always the biggest ATP user. And so for these ATP sensitive, uh, you know, channels, it's really critical who's living right next door. Um, and who's who's abutting it. And so these little micro domains have not been even touched by anyone in the field. No one knows the spatial arrangement of this. We're just now getting technologies that can look at this. And, and I would also say, right, it's like a timing thing too, that you have to capture it when it's there. So that makes it even more complicated to, to pin it down and study it. And everything is a timing issue. So an awful lot of what we know, <laughs> we know at, at a you know, someone will do a million measurements at one point in time that may not be reflective of what the dynamic of what's actually happening. And so it's only recently that we're really able to look in enough detail at a time course. And everything that we look at in a time course changes fairly quickly, channels more quickly than most. <laughs> Okay, well, it's a space the, time problem, just like yeah, physics. I was, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's physics. So I guess, you know, in the interest of time, so appreciate you staying on longer, everyone. Um, I guess I would just say it's time for the next generation uh, of trainees to start uh, diving into the realm mm -hmm. of uh, cell biology, electrophysiology, and I don't know, nanoparticles, even who knows, um, uh, to try to just sort of like uh, tease apart some of these answers. Um, I so appreciate all of um, you know the experts today, uh, Dr. Francis Ashcroft, Dr. Barbara Corky, Dr. Matthew Marins, and others who contributed to the conversation. It was fascinating. And um, it's really um, uh, you know, an honor to be in your presence and, and hear what you have to say in this, uh, this arena. Really appreciate it. I hope you have a great rest of your evening and day.